Um, the next speaker is a, a, a wonderful friend, uh, a phen phenomenal surgeon from uh, Katharina Hospital. His name is Misha Laya, and his publication on, on the Neutron 2 trial has um, educated the whole world. Misha uh, is a surgeon who went to university at Nijmegen. He performed research in Mayo Clinic, Rochester, USA for a year and did his uh, PhD at the Maastricht University uh, Medical Center. Uh, he, since then, uh, he's moved uh, his surgical training and started at Katharina Hospital, Eindhoven, and then he was appointed consultant in that hospital. Uh, and he's an upper GI and bariatric surgeon and pancreatic surgeon with a sp special focus on uh, mini-invasive and uh, robotic techniques. Uh, he's now at national training uh, in upper GI surgery uh, and a proctor for totally MIE and also the uh, chair uh, of the Dutch upper GI registry. And the floor is yours, Misha. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed, for the very kind introduction. And uh, it's, an, uh, it's a great honor to show our results of the early nutrition, the Nutrient 2 trial. Um, these are my disclosures. And um, I want to start with a poll. What do you think is the best time to start oral intake following esophagectomy, minimal invasive or open? A, do you start uh, enteral nutrition via, for example, a jejunostomy and um, uh, gradually increase oral intake from day seven or later? Or do you start enteral nutrition via jejunostomy or nasal jejunal tube and then start at day five to seven or start oral intake as soon as possible? At least I know one answer from Ed um, uh, what's going to be, but I'm very anxious to uh, hear your uh, results. Um, I want to make the parallel with uh, cycling. This is a picture of our oncology team and we uh, did a fundraiser and cycled to uh, Alpe d'Huez in France and was the goal to cycle it six times. Um, so everybody asked, uh, how do I cycle the best? And everybody focuses on the big changes. For example, uh, the bike on the right side, it, it, it's a no brainer that this is faster than a bike on the left side. Both bikes are from Eddie Merckx who won the Tour de France on the bike on the left in 1966. And this is what especially surgeons do. Uh, they talk about big changes, open versus minimal invasive, eros versus no eros, adjuvant treatment, new adjuvant treatment, no new adjuvant treatment. However, in cycling, most focus is, uh, uh, fo most teams focus on small changes, or small changes, the marginal gains. Team Sky has been great about this and they have uh, won the Tour de France for several years. And they say that if you improve in every aspect, 1%, the ultimate gain will be enormous. And these are very small things. Uh, the, the, the cyclists have their own pillow. Uh, they have adequate supply of materials so they don't have to wait. They have a standard setting of the bike. So it's not the individual things on itself that make a difference, but it's all these small things together which will make the change. And this is what uh, we try to do in our care pathway as well. You, are, you heard Ed talking about prehabilitation and you can adapt in that as well. Uh, perioperative protocols, anesthesia protocols, we will hear, hear about that later, but also minimal invasive of, or robotic surgery. Uh, surgery. And in the post-operative uh, protocols, the Eros protocols, also some things can be changed and optimized, at least in our opinion. So I, I don't know if we can show the um, results of the poll. Oh, that's uh, surprising. So most people start all intake as soon as possible uh, and other people start at fi day five to seven and only a minority of people uh, start at day seven or later. Uh, when we, uh, we did a, a round of, uh, on the expert centers. We uh, saw that the uh, most common um, uh, uh, nutritional protocol was nil, nil per mouth for five days and then using uh, enteral nutrition via jejunostomy. There, was, there has been a lot of literature on uh, why early oral intake may be beneficial in upper GI surgery. And there are three studies uh, which showed that you can start early oral intake. However, the first study had only 80 subjectomies. The second study selected patients postoperatively and the third study 
they uh, compared it to nil per mouth for seven days and additional TPN. So it's not really state of the art. So what we first did is uh, the nutrient one study and we tried to assess the safety and feasibility of our early oral intake in 50 patients. We had a data safety monitoring board and we assessed complications. And um, we, we saw that uh, complications were the main determinant for stop of oral intake. We had complications which were comparable with the literature and early oral intake start was safe. Uh, and what we did is we changed the, uh, the diet. They cannot eat at will, but they get small portions of purified, liquefied uh, nutrition, soup or uh, salmon purified or uh, like a dessert. And they get it six to eight times a day. And ultimately the goal is to uh, uh, have an intake of about 1500 to 1800 calories at day five. And what's also important, we don't, do not do a pyloroplasty and we also uh, remove the nasogastric tube immediately after surgery and sometimes even don't insert it. So after this feasibility trial, we did the nutrient two study in three hospitals in which we compared early oral intake with uh, nil per mouth, uh, standard of care. So nil per mouth, but they get uh, enteral oral intake uh, via jejunostomy for five days. Uh, to assess outcome, we used functional recovery. That's a more objective parameter in our eyes uh, compared with, for example, hospital stays. And you have to um, be uh, fulfilling all criteria which are listed here. So they have to be uh, adequate, have to pay, have adequate pain control, walk around, have enough uh, caloric intake, no signs of infections and no intravenous fluids. This is what it looked like. So on the bed, the, everybody got a jejunostomy just to get some type of standardization that only oral intake was the, uh, the, the parameter uh, which changed. And then in the yellow tab, there was uh, delayed oral feeding. So they got feeding via, via a jejunostomy. The red tab was direct start of oral intake. So no feeding via the jejunostomy. And these were the results um, we had. So you have to keep in mind, we had an ERAS protocol already in place and we saw that the functional recovery in the direct or feeding group was seven days. So comparable also what, um, what Ed showed and in the standard of care group, it was eight days. And in the per, per protocol analysis, so these are all patients which uh, adhere to the uh, feeding protocol. It was six days in the intervention group and seven days in the control group. Although this was different, this was not statistically uh, significant. We then look at the complications. You see that pneumonia, which uh, especially aspiration pneumonia was feared in the beginning, was the same in both groups. And also complications were similar and especially anastomotic leakage was not different between the groups. What was different was chi leakage. We saw it less in the direct oral feeding group. We don't have a, an exact explanation for this. Maybe it's because the patients who are getting oral uh, or enteral intake via jejunostomy were a little bit um, overfed and that maybe the uh, uh, triggered chi leakage, but that, that's just guessing. Uh, if we do looked at the protocol deviations, 36% protocol deviations in the direct oral feeding group and 39% uh, in the delayed oral feeding group. And these were all uh, mainly, ba uh, mainly caused by complications, anastomotic leakage or respiratory insufficiency or postoperative ileus or gastroparesis. And only 6% of the patients in this group uh, didn't meet the caloric intake. So if they had no complications, most of people, 94% met the oral intake. So we extended this cohort because uh, we had the feeling that there was still a difference and uh, we extended to 196 patients uh, with similar characteristics as in the Nutrient 2 study, age of 66 years, comorbidity in 66.4%. So we didn't select at all. And in the Netherlands, most of the people are uh, treated with neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy. So here are the results of the extended group. And there you can see that functional recovery is seven days in the direct oral feeding group and nine days in the standard of care. 
And this was different. Uh, also hospital stay, eight versus 10 days. And in the per protocol analysis, six days of the uh, functional recovery in the uh, direct oral feeding group versus seven days in the standard of care. So uh, what is interesting, if we then look at the complications, um, pneumonia was not different, but overall complications re were reduced in direct oral feeding group. Also, anastomotic leakage was the same. And uh, we saw again, I'm sorry, we saw again that chi leakage was strongly reduced in the direct oral feeding group. Again, the, the explanation would be something about overfeeding of uh, uh, the uh, enteral nutrition via GGNostomy, but we are not sure. So what's the effect of uh, all these marginal gains? So more than oral intake uh, only is that this is the registry data from the Netherlands. And you can see the data from your own hospital compared to the all overall uh, uh, performance in the Netherlands. And we looked at textbook outcome. That's a composition a parameter in which you say that every patient had a textbook outcome is had no readmission to the ICU, no readmission to the hospital, um, enough lymph nodes, radical resection, and um, no complications greater than Clavian Dindo grade two. You see that 70% of our patients were uh, had a textbook outcome compared to 47% in the Netherlands. So that's a gain of 23.5%. And I'm confident that it's because the, all the small gains we made in the whole care pathway. This is also on the long term, this is important uh, because we have shown that textbook outcome uh, is correlated with overall survival. Uh, this is a graph uh, from the ESO bench benchmark and you uh, can see that in the green line, uh, patients with a textbook outcome did significantly better on the long term compared with uh, patients who did not have a textbook outcome. And also if you look at the survival from our hospital compared to the Netherlands, you see the same trend. So some key takeaways, direct, oral intake, direct start of oral intake is feasible and safe. The recovery is improved, especially in a setting of low complication rate and complications are the main reasons to start artificial nutrition. And this is uh, Marco Pantani. He cycled to Alp de West in 36 minutes. That's the fastest ever. So here, all these marginal gains he had uh, resulted in a perfect performance. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Misha. Um, and we will have time for some uh, questions for you, Misha. Uh, most of them are, are, are pertaining to, to uh, the Hon Lo uh, and previously before. Now, Misha, what in, in this trial, um, which is an excellent trial, uh, what do you think uh, you could, this could add to, I know, you work in the top 10% of the hospital compared to the rest of the world, but for the rest of the world, the other, uh, the majority, the one belonging to the 90% in, in the middle, uh, what, how could they start this um, early feeding? What would be the biggest hurdle to cross? Yeah, I think uh, there are a couple of hurdles, maybe. Uh, so uh, we performed this in a, in a setting in which uh, we had a learning curve for minimal invasive Ivor Lewis uh, esophagectomy, and we surpassed the learning curve. I think we, you shouldn't start doing this type of improvement when you haven't um, um, have, have like surpassed the learning curve. As for example, it, it doesn't matter to ride a, a, a carbon fiber bike when you're overweight. Yeah? So you need to have optimized all the, the, the obvious things. And then you can, I think, start doing early oral feeding. And also what is important, um, and so the, the gastroparesis in our uh, cohort was 9%. And we first assessed that before we start taking out the nasogastric tube. And then we started to gradually increase the oral intake. So I wouldn't let them eat at will. I, I really I believe in uh, to start very slowly, but I'm not sure how you feel about that. No, I, I believe that what you're doing is appropriate for what you have which is called the local factors. And that's very, very correct.
because you got to take it uh, by ear because they, they are also learning. The staff members are also learning. The kitchen staff are learning. You know, there's a uh, very important question coming to talk about kitchen staff regarding early feeding from Jonas Sandsberg Lundahl. It says, how do you change standards in hospitals where the kitchen staff, administration, etc., to accommodate your enhanced recovery program? Sorry, that's a difficult question. Yeah, it's difficult, but it's a very good question. And the main uh, tip I can give everyone is to visit somebody uh, like uh, Suzanne visited Don Lowe, uh, you are visiting everybody who goes and visit with a team and they see it themselves, then it's the change is made very, uh, at least much more easy. So um, th that that's the the, the main uh, tip I can give you. Uh, that that's what we did, and uh, it, it worked. One of the other question is: When do you start solid oral feed, not pure diet, not liquid diet, solid? Yeah, yeah solids uh, mostly when they visit the outpatient clinic, so after two weeks. Um, and the main reason to start the purified or liquefied nutrition is that they cannot overeat. They, uh, some people have uh, eat very fast. If they take solid foods, they can overeat with the solids and they cannot do it with the purified or the liquefied. So that, that's the reason. So after two weeks. Thank you so much, Misha. I think we should uh, move on to uh, the next speaker.